In this video, I will share 10 Google Tag Manager best practices that you should follow. The first best practice, in my opinion, is related to the account structure. First of all, you have to be familiar with how Google Tag Manager accounts are structured and how many containers would you need to create and so on. So in general, you have the Google account, that's the account that you use to log into your Google services, and then you can create Google Tag Manager accounts. Inside each account, you can have multiple containers. So in this case, the rule that I am following is that one GTM account is for one business. And then the container might be for one website or it might be for several websites. If you are an agency, then customer's business should own the Google Tag Manager account because I've seen some agencies where they have their own account and each container is for one client, which in my opinion is not a good approach. I have even heard about several situations where eventually the relationship between the client and the agency goes quite bad and then the customer becomes a hostage of the situation because the agency disables client's access to the container. And if you are a business that is using services of some agencies, you must own the Google Tag Manager account. As for the containers, or in other words, how many containers do you need? There is no simple answer. The answer is actually, it depends. In some situations, it makes more sense to have separate containers for each website. In other situations, it might make sense to have multiple websites using the same container. I have a separate tutorial about this particular topic that will help you decide how many containers do you need. And I will post a link to it below the video. But as for accounts, I cannot stress this enough that for one business, it is enough to have one Google Tag Manager account. Then the next best practice, in my opinion, is to have a proper naming convention. Don't name your tags or triggers or variables randomly. This would be an example of a bad naming convention. You have a tag which is named contact, but what does it actually mean? Will it fire some event when the contact form is submitted? Or is that some listener that is looking for particular clicks on your website or maybe something else? When the number of items in your container is very small, then poor naming convention is not that big of a problem. But in the future, as your container grows and maybe you will have 50 tags, 100 tags or even more, then naming convention will become very important. For example, here, in my opinion, is a pretty decent naming convention because when your tags are named consistently, then they are even sorted properly in the list. For example, if I scroll to the bottom of this particular list, all my GE4 tags are one next to another. And then it is a bit easier for me to find what I'm looking for. Of course, there is a pretty good search feature in Google Tag Manager. But again, just having proper naming convention makes your work with Google Tag Manager easier. Speaking of the naming convention that I use, here's what I would recommend. All of my tags start with a vendor name. For example, it could be Google Ads, G4, Facebook, or something like that. Then if there are multiple types of that tag, I also include it in the name. In case of Google Analytics, we have the Google tag or configuration tag, and then we have event tags. If we're talking about event tags, then the next part of the tag name includes the event that I'm sending to GA4. So if at some point I want to quickly find the tag that sends the form submission event to GA4, it will be fairly easy. I just open the list, scroll to the GA4 event tags, and then I will quickly find form submission because the entire list is sorted alphabetically. Or if you don't want to include the event name, then maybe you can add a brief description. For example, describe what does that tag do? like contact form submission or you know something like that. When it comes to variables, I always start with the variable type. For example, here is data layer variable. And then what kind of information does this variable return? In this example, this variable will return transaction ID, which is inside the e-commerce object. Of course, some might argue that variable type is not necessary in the beginning of the variable name, because if you go to the list of variables in Google Tag Manager, the variable type is already visible here. But personally, I find this more convenient because when I go to the list of variables, I know where can I quickly find all my data layer variables because they all start the same. So this was my recommendation, but again, you don't have to follow it. My main message here is just that you should try to experiment with different naming conventions and pick the one that makes most sense to you and your organization. Another best practice in my opinion is that only the right people should have enough permissions in Google Tag Manager container. I see way too many situations where let's say 10 or 20 people have admin access to the Google Tag Manager account and container. And then eventually I find out that most of them don't have enough Google Tag Manager knowledge and skills to actually carry full responsibility for the container. 
And this also applies to agencies if you are using their services. In my opinion, the customer should still have the main admin rights and then other users might have, let's say, publish rights or edit or just view. You can manage permissions of your container and account in the admin section, either in the user management of account or user management of container. And when you click on a particular user, make sure that only experienced enough users have, let's say, publish access. The next step is about using constant variables. Let me show you an example where these kind of variables might be useful. Here I have a container and inside of it I have two tags. One is the Google tag, also known as configuration tag, and the other one is for form submissions. As you can see in both tags, I had to manually type my measurement ID. In this example of two tags, it's okay if you have the ID entered manually. But what if you have 50 Google Analytics for tags and at some point your company decides to start using a new property or something like that, which means that the measurement ID will also change. If all of your tags have the ID entered manually, it means that you will have to edit all those tags one by one and manually change the ID. But alternatively, you could use a constant variable that contains your ID and then use that variable in your tags instead. So let me show you what I mean. Let's copy the measurement ID, then I will go to variables, and then I will click new in the user defined variables. Then I click variable configuration and constant. Here I paste the ID and I can call this, let's say GA4 and then measurement ID. Or let's follow my own naming convention, constant. Click save. Now I can go to tags and edit my first tag. So instead of this manually entered ID, I can remove it and insert my constant variable and then do the same thing in my event tag. So let's delete this and insert the variable. So if at some point I need to change the ID of all my tags, I will just have to go to variables, find my constant variable and then change the ID here. And then after I save the variable, all tags that are using this variable will automatically get the new ID, which makes the management of tags much easier. When you're working with Google Tag Manager, you always have to keep an eye on the page speed because if you add an empty container of Google Tag Manager, by itself, it adds very, very minimal impact on your page speed performance. But what matters is what you add inside that container. If you add, let's say, 10 different tracking pixels, for example, LinkedIn, Facebook, Google Analytics, Google Ads, and so on, then your page speed performance will drop significantly. I have even written a blog post about the impact of Google Tag Manager and tags on page speed. I will post a link to it below the video. So my main idea is that you should definitely read this blog post. And here I mentioned several things, for example, how to test your page speed. And there are several websites that you can use. For example, I often use webpagetest.org. And if you do some optimization, or maybe if you add some new features or new tags to your container, you should definitely run a test. I mean, you should first run the test before implementing this and then after and see if there is a significant drop in page speed performance. If yes, then maybe you should optimize something. For example, maybe some tags could be fired later because one of the findings in this blog post is that the moment when you fire your tags matters. The sooner you fire your tags, the more impact they will have on page speed which implies that if some tags could be fired after the entire page is loaded, then your page speed will be better. Speaking of page speed, one of the ways how you can improve it would be by using server-side tagging. In a nutshell, here's how it works. On your website, Google Tag Manager is loaded, then Google Analytics tags are fired, but instead of sending that request directly to Google, you're sending it to your own server, and then here, server-side tag manager, will handle the request and will send data to your vendor. Now you might say that this looks like an overkill, but here's the beauty of server-side tag management. Because here on the server level, you can also process that incoming data and send it to other vendors as well. For example, Facebook. So instead of having Google Analytics and Facebook Pixel active here, you have just Google Analytics. And then in your server, you're sending data to multiple places which means that you have fewer JavaScript tracking codes on your website and your page performance is not affected that much. So this is one of the benefits when it comes to server-side tagging. You can also control what kind of data is sent to vendors, which is important in this privacy landscape. 
then you can reduce the leaks of personally identifiable information. You can also reduce the impact of ad blockers, which means that your data will be more accurate. When I'm recording this video, it is still possible to extend the expiration of cookie lifetime when it comes to Apple's intelligent tracking prevention. But you need to keep in mind that server-side hacking will add you additional costs. So I would say that if you are a small business who doesn't run ads, then server-side hacking is not necessary for you. Also, server-side hacking will make your setup more complex, which means that either you must be more experienced and have more knowledge on how to configure this, or you have to hire someone with that specific knowledge. Then another thing which I cannot stress enough, if you find some blog post or some tutorial that shares a custom JavaScript code that you should implement in Google Tag Manager, first show that code to the developer of the website. It might take them five, 10 minutes, maybe a bit more, but they might save you from big trouble because I have seen some situations where marketers just find some code from an unknown source and they added that code to Google Tag Manager container. And what happened is that the custom code broke the interface of their SaaS product, which means that the customers were not able to use the product and developers were not informed that the custom code was added. So it took them longer to troubleshoot the issue. And as a result, of course, they lost some revenue as well. So before you add some custom code to Google Tag Manager, always try to show that code to the developers first. Then if you're going to track a lot of button clicks or form submissions, it would be a good practice for you to ask the developers to add IDs to important elements of the website. Because if those elements have IDs, then you will be able to fetch that information with variables such as form ID or click ID. For example, here I have a contact form and if I want to track it, I could ask a developer to add an ID to that element. In this case, the ID of the form is contact form. And if the form is submitted, then I could use Google Tag Manager form ID variable to fetch that. The same applies to buttons, for example. If you have several call to action buttons on your website, you could ask the developer to add the ID, like top call to action button and so on. This will make your tag management a bit easier. Then after you implement your changes, always test them before publishing. Google Tag Manager has a wonderful feature which is called Preview and Debug Mode. You can enable it by clicking Preview and then here you will see what kind of tags do you have, if they fired, if they didn't fire, then you can click on Events when they fired, you can click and see what kind of information was sent or at least used by the tag. You can see their firing triggers. So this is the bare minimum that you should do every time you do some changes in the container. Don't blindly publish your changes without testing them. And in fact, ideally, you should rely not just on the preview mode, but also test other parts. For example, when your tag fires, you should go to the website, open developer tools, and then here you can check the network requests. Since we're talking about Google Analytics, all Google Analytics requests contain the word collect. So if I refresh the page, I would expect to see the request and here it is. And we see that the request was successful and this is the data that was sent. I can click payload and check what kind of information was sent. Some of these parameters are too technical, so you might not need to worry about them, but some of them are important. For example, the name of the event or document location, which is page location. So if you see that the data here is correct, then that's good. But you should also check the final destination. In my case, that would be Google Analytics 4. So first of all, I would check the debug view in the admin panel. And if I see the events, I can click them and see what kind of information was sent. If this is correct, then that's also a very good sign. And then eventually after 24 or 48 hours, I would check my other reports like standard reports or explorations and check if the data is displayed there. Check the full journey that your data must complete. Not just the preview mode, but also requests, and then the final destination, which is the debug view and then the reports. And these were my top Google Tag Manager best practices. But of course, this list is not definitive. If you want to learn even more, then take a look at my blog post where I share more tips. I will post a link to it below the video. If you have anything else to add, then post a comment as well. If you found this video useful, hit the like button below the video. That will help me understand what videos do you like and what should I create in the future. Also, if you want to learn more about Google Tag Manager or GE4, then subscribe to this channel. My name is Julius, this is Analytics Mania, and I'll see you in the next video.